I, I welcome you all to um, today's seminar session on ethical issues in organ transplantation. Today's speaker is Dr. John Roberts, a professor of surgery and chief of the Division of Transplantation at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, Dr. Roberts received his MD from the University of California, San Diego, uh, did residency training in surgery at the University of Washington, and then fellowship training at Cornell and later at the University of Minnesota. Um, uh, Dr. Roberts remains very active in the clinical practice of transplantation, uh, treating patients at UCSF, um, and very active also in organ transplantation policy. Um, for example, this year, Dr. Roberts is the president of UNOS, um, which uh, helps to establish national policy for organ uh, distribution um, uh, and, and follow-up studies. Um, today's topic is, is one that, that um, I heard originally about a year and a half ago, uh, or heard an earlier version of it in Valencia, and I was just, uh, it, it, it raised questions that had never occurred to me about risks and benefits to donors and recipients, and, um, and I, I won't say anything more about it. But today's, today's talk is entitled, A Living Donor Liver Transplantation, Right or Wrong? I'll turn it over to John. John, welcome. Maybe I'll just hold on to that. For... So um, I, I want to thank uh, Mark for that nice introduction. Um, I actually have some connect, long-term connection with the University of Chicago in that um, back in the 90s when we were, when I was at the University of California, San Francisco, we were interested in starting, interested in starting a living donor program and I came to the University of Chicago to woo John Amon away to come to <laughs> the University of California. Uh, so I, I've actually been here and I um, came to watch John operate and then came a number of years later and, and uh, participated with, or watched um, him do a living donor liver transplant. So I wanted to talk about sort of where we're trying to get to with living donor liver transplantation. You know, I, it's sort of a little Coles to Newcastle. He's talking about some of these ethical principles with a uh, <clears throat> number of ethicists in the room. And, and um, just to tell you, I, I had a lot of help from Mark and from Will Parker here in terms of writing a recent manuscript that uh, we submitted. And, and some of those um, principles will be I'll talk about today. <clears throat> so one of the basic principles of <coughs> living donor liver transplantation is that we wouldn't do living donor liver transplantation if there were enough deceased donor organs available. Unlike kidney, living donor kidney transplant where the outcomes are actually better <coughs> if you get a living donor transplant than if you get a cadaver donor transplant, the outcomes with <coughs> living donor liver transplantation are roughly the same as the outcomes with cadaveric donor transplant. And that's because there's problems with the bile, sewing the bile duct together, the blood vessels, and the graft that the recipient receives is much smaller. So if you think about a, that the cadaver transplant is done with the tree, the whole tree of the blood vessels and the bile ducts as it comes and branches up into the organ, when we do living donor transplants, we're actually just take getting the branches of the tree and those the diameter of the branches are less than the trunk and so the complications of, of sewing those together are higher. And so there's really no benefit to either the recipient or the donor if there's a deceased donor transplant available. So in an area where there's no alternative to living donation, say in Asia, the recipient benefit from a living donor uh, transplantation is maximal and, and and probably even greater donor risk is acceptable. This is the number of living donor transplants that were done in the United States. You can see that in 2000 <coughs> we reached our peak, about 400 transplants a year, and that, and that has decreased to somewhat less than 200. This arrow shows what happened at that uh, time period we introduced what was called the MELD system and the MELD system is the prioritization of patients for transplantation in the United States. It's basically a ranking order depending on how sick they are. 
And <clears throat> when, when we were able to rank patients better, I think the demand for liver transplantation and for living donor transplantation actually fell because those patients had more access to uh, cadaveric donor transplant. And the other thing that happened is that patients with hepatocellular carcinoma also got a higher um, priority for transplantation than they had uh, prior to the introduction of the MELD system. At the same time, there was a, a donor death in New York that was widely publicized, and that is usually what is blamed on this fall, but I actually think it was probably more the availability of organs. Now, I want to point out to you that, you know, in the United States, we only did about 200 organ transplants, and I was invited to go to Taiwan and visit one of the medical centers there <coughs> to talk about living donor transplant. And, and at that hospital, they did more living donor transplants in a year than the entire United States. So that just, you know, puts in perspective kind of the, the global use of living donor transplant as compared to the United States. Now this is a complicated slide, and I'll <coughs> try and give you the gist of it. Basically, in, in the United States, we <coughs> allocate organs in a local area first. I know that this is a mixed audience. I'm sorry if I'm being too, too simple, but I, I want to make sure everybody understands the issues. And we use this MELD score to allocate the organs. <coughs> and within the United States, there's different of these donor service areas, or OPOs as they're also known. And, and <coughs> in, there some, in some areas, the a organ access is better than in other areas. And so you can measure sort of the, the access to organs by the average MELD score at transplantation within that DSA. And this shows that, <coughs> that there's, if you broke the DSAs out into five groups, at the highest score, so the highest, the, group, the DSA where there was the highest MELD score needed for transplantation, you can see that we use the highest number of living donor transplants. So this sort of goes to the point that we, <coughs> if the need is high, we tend to use living donor transplant where the need is low, living donor transplant isn't used. And so this just gives you an, sort of an idea of, of that concept that of need is really is what's driving living donor transplant. There's a group called the <coughs> A2L, which is the adult to adult living <coughs> liver uh, transplant uh, study sponsored by the NIH. And they've looked at sort of the benefit of living donor transplant across the United States. And so if you, <clears throat> the group that they looked at, I'm going to try and use my hands to talk and I'll put this down. The group that they looked at <clears throat> were people that had, a, somebody came forward and said they wanted to donate. And if you said you wanted to donate and, but you were of the wrong blood type or some other issue came that so you couldn't donate, that those, they compared that group of people that had a donor but the donor couldn't donate to a group where the donor did donate and then looked at the outcome for those patients who, who either did or did not end up having a donor. And it, what it, we found is that for a recipient who got a living donor transplant, they had about half the risk of a patient who didn't have a living donor transplant and had to either wait on the waiting list and then die on the waiting list or subsequently got a deceased donor transplant. So living donor transplant definitely decreases your risk of <coughs> dying without a transplant. Now obviously this was, this was done in nine centers in the United States and those centers that do living donor transplants are in areas where the organ availability is low but just demonstrates this principle that <clears throat> there is a, a recipient benefit to getting a living donor transplant if you're in an area where there's a high need. Now another thing in the organ allocation system for livers is that patients with a hepatocellular carcinoma get an advantage to patients who without a hepatocellular carcinoma, and, and it turns out that if you have hepatocellular carcinoma and you have a low MELD score, you don't really get any benefit for living donor transplant because you can get a deceased donor transplant in, in enough period, in enough time. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this basically shows us in a graphical fashion where you can see that if you have a MELD greater than 15 <clears throat> and you didn't have a living donor transplant over a period of time, your probability of death was lower than somebody who had a living donor and regardless of their MELD score. 
and, but patients with who had a low MELD score and a palisader carcinoma got enough benefit that they're from, from the current allocation system that they didn't have to worry about whether or not they needed a living donor transplant. So the recipient benefit really depends on how long it's going to take you to get a transplant based on your MELD score. If your MELD score is too low, the idea is that if you wait longer, you will become sicker and your MELD score will rise and eventually you'll get a transplant. Unfortunately, that's a, <coughs> a concept that we, I think we tell our patients, but it's probably not really true because the, the progression of liver disease is not a linear, it's a more a chaotic fashion. So somebody that has cirrhosis, you know, suddenly gets a variceal hemorrhage or they suddenly get an infection and somebody that was doing relatively well, this, their melds, their, their health falls dramatically, their MELD score goes way up, and they may die during that period of time. You, if you can get them back, they may have a higher MELD score, but it's not the picture of somebody every day you get a little bit sicker and eventually you'll get to the point where you need a, you have a high enough MELD score to get a transplant. So it really depends on your degree of illness and, and sort of the availability of organs. This AC, HCC priority <coughs> diminishes the uh, benefit in, in of living donor transplant secondary to the allocation press allocation preference and so the benefit of living donor transplant really depends upon the availability of deceased donor organs <coughs> now in terms of the donor there's a risk of death that's been estimated between one in a hundred and one of a thousand so you know this is a relatively low risk of death <coughs> you know the, I, to compare it, I think if you live in Boston for 12 years, you have about a 1 in 1,000 risk of death <laughs> as compared to, say, living in another portion of the part of the country. If you drink, I think, a six-pack of Diet Coke a day, you also end up, after about 10 years, having an increased risk of death. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, just to keep you guys, I don't, I'm sure it's higher with, I'm sure it's higher with, sh with sugar-laden Coke, but... And the, and the risk of um, morbidity associated with uh, uh, donation is about 40%. So uh, this is the, the topic that, <clears throat> that Mark can always help me explain correctly. But it, we're, what we're really talking about is, this <clears throat> is the equipoise, which is this state of equilibrium of risk. So in, in a clinical trial, the benefit of society to the society of participating in, in that clinical trial justifies some risk, some level of risk to the trial per participant. For living donor transplant, it's really the balance between this re recipient benefit and donor risk. So <clears throat> when we think about a donor, what they're really doing is taking some level of risk to provide some uh, benefit uh, to the uh, recipient. And they do want to have a, a <coughs> successful outcome for the recipient. They also want to have a successful operation with you know, as little uh, morbidity and mortality as possible. The recipient also wants to minimize the donor risk. Uh, <coughs> they do want to have a successful donor outcome. But at the same time, they also want to have a successful transplant. It is really trying to balance these different uh, perspectives on donation that that is difficult because a, a donor that takes very little risk, <coughs> but ha where but where the recipient has an outcome that is poor, they really haven't benefited from that uh, their pain and suffering. So really, what we want to do is trying to figure out how to <coughs> minimize donor risk and the complexity of the operation and and how much liver we take out of the donor and how much liver is left behind is really a driver of the donor risk. And the risk <coughs> increases from taking out the left lateral segment to the left lobe to the right lobe. So this slide never worked very well for me, but the lateral segment is, is where living donor transplant really started. And it was the taking out the um, portion of the liver here <coughs> where the, this small piece of liver can be donated from a parent to a child. And those, that was where the living donor transplant really started was the surgeons recognized this was a relatively low risk operation to take this portion of the liver out and, and put that into a child. The child got plenty of liver. 
<coughs> when, we, when living donor transplant moved from children to adults, that we really use this, the right side of the liver, which is about two-thirds of the, of the volume of the liver, and because that was thought to provide enough <coughs> um, mass for the recipient, but the, the risk for the donor goes up with that. The other portion of the liver we're going to talk about is the, is the left lobe, which is the lateral segment plus this portion here called the quadrate lobe, and those, that forms about 40, sorry, about 33% of the, of the total volume of the liver. So the first question is, does the risk of death of the donor depend on which lobe is donated? <clears throat> so this is um, some information from the um, Vancouver Forum, which was about living donation in 2006. And you can see that at that time, there were <coughs> three deaths in uh, left lobe uh, donors, there had been 11 deaths in right lobe donors, and the estimates were that donating the left lobe had about <coughs> a, a one fifth the risk than if you donated the right lobe. These are, you know, both relatively low, but still <coughs> um, there's a significant difference between them. Liz Pomfret uh, did a recent survey of all the <coughs> centers in the world and came up that there were about 34 uh, living donor deaths, <coughs> uh, about 30 of these were in right lobes, four in left lobes. In the left lobe deaths the, the, of the four, one was a suicide. In the United States, she <coughs> thought that there were been four uh, right lobe deaths that were definitely related to the surgery and one uh, death in a left lobe patient, which was <coughs> um, a la patient donated actually their lateral segment that was definitely related to the surgery. And so I, if you look at the denominators, you're you come up with a number that is, you know, basically a donation, donating the right side of your liver has about a five times higher risk of death than if you donated the left side. Um, sorry. Uh, so what I want to talk about now is sort of the, um, if you look at the indication for living donor transplant, and here's a survival. So let's say that you had a, a it, w when you did a living donor transplant, 100% of your patients uh, survived. And if you think about how many recipients you save per death of donor, so it's uh, one of those dismal economic terms, if you will, that <coughs> you would see that you would save about <coughs> 200 recipients per death of a donor, whereas if you donate uh, the left lobe, it's about a thousand recipients that you would save per death of the donor, assuming that the operative survival was 100% for both. Now, you could say, well, you know, what would happen if I, if <coughs> it was 200 in the right, 100% in the right lobe and 60% in the left lobe, and you can see that even as you decrease the, the survival for the left lobe, your, your number of, of recipients saved per, per death is actually still within where you'd want to be to take a left lobe. And so this just sort of shows you this in, a, in another slide. We're assuming that, the, that the <clears throat> you had a 20% worse outcome for the left lobe. You can still see sort of the number of, of recipients uh, saved per donor death. Uh, here, as compared to <coughs> the what you would expect in the in the right lobe. Now, Will Parker, um, working with Mark, actually put this into a more graphical form, and, and really looking at the number of of recipient lives saved per donor death, and that's a, a metric that sort of may help us in terms of looking at this decision making process. And here's the graph that <coughs> Will came up with. If you looked at a small left lobe compared to an adequate right lobe, this recipient save per donor death ratio, you can see that if the donor mortality is 80% lower if you donated a left lobe and you looked at the, the relative recipient survival, you can see that, that the ratio of recipient save per donor death is, is high if you assume that the donor mortality is 50% <coughs> in the left lobe, you're, you move down this spectrum, but even still you're, you're looking at a high, if your outcomes are high, you're still looking at this 
a graph demonstrating a benefit, in, in, but if your recipient outcomes tend to be relatively low, then you're, you're, you move beyond the, where you want to be in terms of uh, having the donor have a successful operation at a relatively low risk. So the other aspect of, the, of rare events that we talk about that but people are quite concerned is, is looking at, at patients, donors who've needed their own liver transplant. And that, in, a, in Dr. Pomfret's survey, they call this is a near miss event. We could say it's a, a, a direct hit event, but it's that they didn't die, but they required a, a transplant. And there's been five right lobe donors have required uh, <coughs> a liver tra a transplant, four of them required liver transplants, one required a kidney transplant, but there's been no transplant need for transplants reported for those that have donated their left lobe. So I think we can probably feel fairly safe to say that donating your left lobe is safer than donating your right lobe in terms of the risk of transplant and the risk of death. And I just want to talk a little bit about donor morti morbidity comparing lateral segments to left lobes to right lobes. And the <clears throat> early papers that looked at this really showed that there is an increased bilirubin and in INR with left versus right lobe donation. These go along with having a piece of liver that's, that's smaller than what the recipient actually needs. And you had a longer length of stay associated with right lobe donation. It, there's been a number of papers that have been published looking at the outcomes of, of uh, lateral segment versus left lobe versus right lobe. And if you look at these papers, and they're, they, <coughs> they, all of them except for one reported an increased risk of, mor of morbidity in donating the left lobe versus the right lobe. And that if you looked at it on average, there's about an um, a, a increase at a steady increase in terms of the amount of liver that the donor has left and, and the related to the, inversely related to the uh, <coughs> risk of complications. And so if you look at the lateral segment, where, which leaves about 75% versus the uh, donating the left lobe, which leaves about 66% or, or versus donating the right lobe, which leaves you 33%, you can see this steady increase. There's been Look, there's been multivariate comparisons, and, and there have been two that had fairly disparate results, so they're in the right direction. One said you had a 12-fold increased risk of morbidity associated with donation of the right lobe. The other uh, had a four-fold increase. The extended right lobe is, is when you take the middle hepatic vein with the uh, graft and leave the, the uh, recipient, sorry, the donor with even smaller portion of liver, and they estimated there was a 60 fold increased risk of morbidity associated with donating the right side of your liver. There's been <coughs> these seven studies. They found that the lateral segments were uh, the safest, that complications of left lobe grafts were basically 50% the rate of the right lobe graft, and the, and the risk is really proportional to the size of the liver remnant of the donor. If you do the math, it actually works out really very well. If you just look at the amount of liver that's left, that's really proportional to the to the, to the risk of morbidity. So I think I can safely made, make the point and I can probably convince you that if left lobes are safer for the donor, uh, sorry, there, there really would be no reason to choose the right lobe over the left lobe, assuming that the, that <coughs> the outcome was the same in the recipient. So I think that's kind of where we are in, in trying to figure out you know, is the outcome the same for the recipient given that, <clears throat> that the right lobe appears to be a more hazardous operation for the donor than donating the left lobe? So let's look a little bit about the recipient side. So one of the problems that with the living donor transplant and, and the right lobe <clears throat> versus the left lobe is that the left lobe is a smaller portion of a liver. If you look, if you thought about that, what I told you about the, the recipient, sorry, the donor morbidity, you would say, well, why don't we give everybody a lateral segment? Because that has the lowest morbidity, but it's only 25% of the liver. And, and at some point, that portion of the liver becomes too small for the recipient to survive after the operation. And so, <clears throat> though it has the lowest risk, we, we have to say that we can't use that smallest portion of the liver in, say, in a, in, in a from a, in a large person because they're going to end up being a, having not enough liver and, and their, their outcome will suffer. 
So <clears throat> one of the things that we'd like to do is trying to figure out is if, if we knew the problem with the small grafts, could we do something to allow us to transplant smaller pieces of liver, decrease the risk in the, in the donor, but also allow adequate uh, recipient outcomes? And that's where I think people are trying to get to in the world of living, uh, adult to adult living donor transplants. So one of it is, is what's the relative benefit of a left lobe versus the right lobe graft to the recipient? And then what role does graft size play in the outcome? And I, I just <coughs> want to um, make a mention that, you know, some of the early work uh, on looking at sort of the relationship between recipient outcome and <coughs> um, the size of the donor graft was actually done with, with John Renz and, and um, John Amon. So I'll give <coughs> so you, you know that John Renz actually played some, some role in this. And so really the question is what role does graph size play in this outcome? And when we think about what happens in terms of these small graphs, we have what's called the small for size syndrome, which is really where you have a partial allograft that's unable to, to simultaneously regenerate because what we need to have that small piece of liver do is to grow up to be the size that that recipient needs and the same process happens in the donor where the donor remnant grows up to be the size that the, that the uh, donor needs and it's unlike kidney transplantation where you when you donate a kidney that other kidney hypertrophy some but you don't replace that loss of renal mass with liver the liver regenerates and you actually replace that uh, liver mass and this small for size syndrome is you get the <coughs> patients get ascites their liver doesn't produce enough of the clotting factors and they become jaundice so their bilirubin goes up in the later stages they become encephalopathic they can develop renal failure and eventually die and in this we want to make sure there aren't any technical issues, but we usually see it in the first week uh, following uh, the organ transplant. Now, to <clears throat> what we think is the problem is, is that after the partial transplant, the, the graft is subject to the entire flow of the portal system. And this cirrhotics, what we think is primarily because they have very large spleens, and, and the splenomegaly is a typical manifestation of, of cirrhosis, is that they have a supernormal portal flow. It's probably beyond just the large spleen, but we think the large spleen definitely plays a role in it. Now, in somebody that has a normal liver, I can go and do an operation on them <coughs> to remove about 75% of their liver, which is, think about it, that's, that's as like as if I transplanted the lateral segment, which is about 25% of the liver. And the, more, the operative <coughs> mortality in that patient that, say, had their right side of their liver taken out because they had cancer is actually relatively low. And that's <clears throat> because they don't have this supernormal flow, their spleen is of normal size. And so what we think is that if we can control that supernormal flow through that graft, that we can allow that graft to, uh, to regenerate. And so what we think is that the portal hypertension between the, the patient that we're doing the liver donor, living donor transplant on and that patient who has a normal liver who we can do hepatic resections on, is, is this is really what we think is the key factor. So <clears throat> the, we're, in terms of what the issues are, one is graft size is important. And it's thought that a, if we weighed the graft and, and calculated what we thought the recipient's liver, <coughs> uh, sorry, the recipient's liver volume would be, versus what the graft size would be that about 40%, if we give that recipient about 40% of what we calculated their need to be, that those, those are at lower risk. <coughs> or if you looked at the weight of the graft to the recipient's weight, a, a percentage greater than 0.8 is, is an adequate, yes? Can you give somebody two small pieces instead of one big piece? Brilliant, yes. <laughs> Um, and, and that's been done in, in, in Korea, where they, you take two lateral segments, and, and I wasn't going to go into it, but well, I'm happy to, to divert my talk. So what you're really trying to do then is give, this, if, give them the same mass with using two small livers, and that has been done doing two lateral segments from, from two different donors into, into one person. It, it's, as somebody said, living donor liver transplant has a potential 
200% mortality, both the donor and the recipient to die, this would have a 300% mortality. But I, I think it is, you know, it's, it's a very interesting problem and sort of one I was going to see if I get well interested down the road is, you know, how do you decide two people that donate a smaller portion of their liver to the, to the, to the donor? And I think if you went back and thought about that, you know, how many lives saved per donor death, you'd still be on the good side even if you had two people. So it's a very good question. And anybody else wants to interrupt, just go ahead. I'm happy to, because <clears throat> I've been, I've been, that's one of the things I've been interested in. We could sort of parlay that from what we've done. So we, we need to have a regenerative response <clears throat> in this uh, graph to allow it to grow. We think that the, the blood flow to the liver is important. And just to get technical, it's not just the, probably not just the amount of portal vein flow that goes to the liver. That portal vein flow may decrease hepatic arterial flow and you may get a subsequent injury from that. that <coughs> I can see Mike nodding his head because it is a, it's just a, it's a, it's, re, they're related, but I, it's a little technical to get into that right now. In terms of recipient factors, the, how big your spleen is, the degree of portal hypertension probably plays a role. <coughs> we think that Patients with lower MELD scores may have lesser degrees of portal hypertension. Your child's class, which is a measure of sort of how much ascites you have, how much encephalopathy, and how, and how jaundiced you are. And then we think the donor age and the recipient age are probably important aspects. The donor age, I think if you have a young donor, say in their 20s, their liver has, has a greater ability to regenerate, say, than a 50-year-old. Than and we know that for young, very young patients who get a Tylenol overdose, it's, it's very rare that they need liver transplant because their liver can regenerate faster than, say, us older people. <coughs> so there have been <coughs> studies that, and, and the, the effect of graph size on, <coughs> on recipient outcome has been quite controversial. There, there was a study published in 2009 looking at graphs below 35%. We said 40% is sort of this cutoff um, and they had 33% of patients with graft size less than that than 35% compared them to pay 87 patients with graft size greater than 35% and, and really found no difference in survival. I will say that they weren't a lot below 35%. They were, you know, they weren't 25%, but they were, say, 32%. Um, <coughs> the, the group in Toronto has published saying that the graft weight to recipient weight ratio is not a predictor of outcome, and, and there was another uh, similar paper that also stated this. This is different than, than sort of the early work that suggested that small graphs have worse outcome. The problem is, is that it's difficult because you need to control these things for all those other factors, the, the recipient's spleen size, the amount of portal hypertension, those different kinds of things. But I just want to make it clear that it's not, it's not an absolute that, that the recipient to graph weight ratio is, is a, a, a the only factor or a major factor in the predictor of outcome. <coughs> the group from Hong Kong, which has uh, had a lot of experience, and they tend to use these extended right lobes, uh, so they're taking sort of more of the, of the liver, if you will, and they found that they're really, uh, that they thought their biggest risk factor for uh, experience, for, with small for sizes, that was experience, and that they thought as they gained more experience, they saw less and less small for size syndrome. I'm not sure that as you gain experience, you, you recognize that this is happening, but it's not as, as much of an issue as you thought. And they thought it wasn't related to the recipient MELD score. So there is probably a size where that graft is too small. And we think that one of the things that may happen, as we talked about, is that you're trying to force too much blood through that small piece of liver. And, and when you try and do that, what probably happens is you increase the pressure upstream from the liver. And so that rise in that pressure we think is important. And, and this was an article that published, got published in 2005 that sort of got me moving down this path. And that was that you, the group, this group found that they could use porticable shunts. So a porticable shunt is where I actually divert some of that blood flow upstream from the liver and, and look at it as you can look at it as sort of a pop-off valve for pressure. So if the pressure is too high, you're, you're shunning blood away from the liver. And they found that by doing this, they could increase the one-year patient survival from 40% to 87.5% and the graft survival from 20 to 75%. Retrospective study, no, con you know, it's 
but it sort of got, I think, a lot of us thinking that maybe we could do something to try and pr improve the, the outcome in these small graphs and allow us to do transplants with less donor risk but with similar recipient benefit. Over time, I've become, as many, as you think, learn, and you start off, you think, well, there's a simple answer to this, and we, all we have to do is do this, and as you gain more and more experience, you begin to realize that the answers are probably not as simple as we thought, and <clears throat> I think we're unclear now, in, in based on that information I told you earlier about the relationship between graph size and recipient outcome. There are some patients we think we do need to do it in, we don't really know when we need to do it, what, what <coughs> factors are important to decide which patients need this portal inflow modification. And then we have a variety of different things that we can do to decrease this portal inflow. One of them is we can just ligate the splenic ar the artery to the spleen, ligate that splenic artery, decreases splenic blood flow. It's not a huge effect, but sometimes that provides a, an improvement in, by a few millimeters of mercury. And, the other thing the Japanese are advocating is splenectomy. And the reason that they think splenectomy may be good in, in particularly the patients with hepatitis C is that after transplant when you're trying to treat the hepatitis C with our current drugs is that the low platelet count, the low white count are, are barriers to adequate treatment of hepatitis C. And so the Japanese are advocating splenectomy in the situation where you have too much portal inflow and, and they believe that this is worthwhile, at least in patients with hepatitis C. An alternative we can do is do a porticable shunt. So one of the things that we're, to get to that point of, I don't exact, I don't really know which patients we should be doing the portal cable shunts in. There is this idea that if you measure that portal pressure, then it's less than 15 millimeters of mercury, that that may be a key to this. And this was a paper, excuse me, from Japan that demonstrated that if, if they had patients with a portal pressure less than 15 millimeters of mercury had a better two-year survival than patients with portal pressures uh, equal or greater to than 15 millimeters of mercury. Now these are absolute portal pressures and not the gradient which we think is more important um, and, and there's sort of been more discussion about whether it's the absolute portal pressure, the gradient, or actually the portal flow that is more important in terms of the one having a, the um, proved outcome or, or two having, uh, knowing which patients you should modulate their, their portal inflow. So when we do these transplants, we, <clears throat> if this is our left lobe graft and this is, uh, the, the um, if this is our left lobe graft and this is the portal vein and here's the inferior vena cava, we usually sew the left portal vein to the donor to the to the left uh, portal vein of the recipient and this remaining right portal vein we can sew to the vena cava so that if there's too much pressure some blood will go this direction some blood will go that direction but you protect this graft and over time that graft uh, regenerates becomes larger and and then the problem is is that you're left with this surgical shunt we think many of these probably close off over time but there, there have been uh, reports, and we've actually had to close uh, one in a recipient who developed post-operative problems. So this is a picture of the, <coughs> of the shunt where we have the right portal vein connected to the vena cava, the left portal vein connected to the graft, and this is the hepatic vein. So you can see that there's this idea that some blood would go in either direction. People want to try and regulate this. There's, you know, trying to make sure you have adequate flow but not too much flow. And I, the other thing I'll, in terms of a technical issue is that we measure these pressures and flows during the operation. As soon as we close that patient's abdomen, wake them up from anesthesia, probably when they eat their first meal, many of these hemodynamics change and we don't really know where, what we're doing. And, and so there has to be a lot more study in terms of trying to understand exactly what the portal hemodynamics are. I just want to talk about our left lobe experience. We published this with um, John Botha, who was at the University of Nebraska at the time, and this is our experience at UCSF. Um, <clears throat> at that time, we'd done uh, 10 graphs without portal inflow modification. Uh, these graphs <clears throat> uh, had a uh, mean graph weight to recipient weight ratio of about 0.78 and, and had a, a standard liver volume. We talked about 
uh, 40 percent that this was, these were somewhat beneath that. If we looked at the left lobe graphs where we, where we did portal uh, model, modulation, there were 20 graphs and you can see these are much smaller graphs and much smaller graph weight to recipient weight ratio. So we, w during this study, we were making decisions uh, based on the size of the liver, the portal pressure. Um, Jean had, was sort of more aggressive with the shunts. I was a little more, you know, trying to, trying to make sure that, that I thought that the patient needed it. And, but these are the data as they were. And you can see that these are the, <coughs> the um, standard liver volumes to graph weight ratios of the uh, left lobes that we used. Um, these are results in terms of the recipients. Uh, INR and, and uh, bilirubin, you can see that they go up, but, but over time they come down. These are probably, if you, if you overlaid the curve of a right lobe graft, you'd see a much rapper, rap, more rapid fall in the recipient. The, this is the portal pressure measurements with the shunt clamped and the shunt open. You can see the shunts have a significant effect on the, on the portal cable gradient, and these are the regeneration of the liver as measured by CT scan. So, and our patient survival in terms of using these left lobe graphs, and, and granted, you know, we're, we're not, not pushing the total uh, <coughs> um, envelope here, that we had, you know, really very acceptable uh, patient and graft survivals looking at uh, those that had, uh, even those that needed portal inflow modulation. So I, I as I said earlier, I think we, we, when we, when we and the other investigators in the world started doing this, we thought we probably knew who need, we needed to do it for. I'm not sure we actually know what patient, which group of patients benefit from it. I think we need to figure out when we need to do it and what we need to do, as I talked about earlier, and I think these are sort of important research questions. The problem is, is that in the United States, we don't have the numbers in order to, to try and answer a lot of these questions. We're gonna be really dependent upon uh, the Asian investigators who are doing, you know, some of the, some of the centers are doing a one living, one or two living donor transplants a day versus, you know, our maybe two a month. And so I think what, what I'm talking about here is there's this balance between <coughs> donor risk and recipient benefit. And, and I think that if, if the left lobe was safer, is safer, I, I hope I convinced you that for the donor, but more hazardous to the recipient, where should this balance of risk lie? And <clears throat> I um, w gave a, a similar talk to a group of um, people and, and I had an audience response system and I asked them, you know, if you were <clears throat> donating to your, ch to your loved one, what, r what personal risk would you be okay with accepting in order to save the life of your loved one? And they said, you know, I had, you know, 1%, 5%, 10%, 50%, and, and 50% was the number that these people pushed their audience response system, and I was like blown away. I thought that <coughs> was amazing. And I, somebody, you know, I was sort of stunned by that, and somebody came up to me afterwards and said, you, you have to recognize that the audience that you're talking to, first off, that most of these, uh, the audience member are nurses, so they're sort of used to, you know, being in a situation of taking care of sick people. <coughs> they're women and they're mothers. And they're not talking about their spouse. <laughs> well, that, that, that I thought. But I, I asked them also, you know, if you were the recipient, what increased risk are you willing to take in order to decrease the donor's risk from, say, you know, one in a thousand to one in a hundred, and, and they were still willing to take a much larger risk than I thought they'd be willing to take in order to have a relatively small decrease in the, <clears throat> in the donor risk. And I think it's a, sort of an interesting question that each of us, you know, would think about, you know, as your child, your loved one, you know, what risk would you be willing to take if they were donating to you or you were donating to them? And I think it's a very interesting uh, question that maybe we could at some point do a survey upon. So I'll just give you an example. This was a 59-year-old <clears throat> fellow with alcoholic cirrhosis. He had a MELD of 13. This MELD score in our area won't get you a transplant. It won't get you a transplant in Chicago either. <clears throat> um, he had, but he had multiple complications of the liver disease, including encephalopathies and ascites. He was a relatively large fellow who weighed 105 kilos. 
his donor was a 43-year-old <coughs> friend of his who had a, a left lobe volume of about 450 cc's. This uh, turned out to be a graft to recipient weight ratio of 0.4 and a graft weight to standard liver volume of 0.23 uh, or 23 percent. And <coughs> the donor did great. And I think one of the things that you, if you do enough of these right lobe and left lobe donors, you, you really see that the donors who donate their left lobe do so much better. It may be, you know, the incision's a little bit different, but it, I think it really is the mass of liver that they're left. He, he leapt out of bed and had a low bilirubin, was discharged on day three. We saw him two weeks later and no complications. <clears throat> in terms of the recipient, he had a high gradient. We ended up doing a porticable shunt uh, to decrease that gradient. I, my number is <clears throat> less than 12 for a gradient, uh, but his was, was well above that. Um, he had a post-operative day two. He started with a relatively low bilirubin. It rose to 6.9. Coagulation studies were normal, but over a period of time, these, he gradually got better, similar to what we looked at that other thing. And on day 14, he had a bilirubin at 2.3 and an INR 1.3. Much slower course than somebody that, say, got the right lobe. I, I think he, he has sort of had a greater struggle. And that's the other thing you notice, that the people that get the left lobe, the recipients, they struggle more. They have sort of a longer post-operative course. He needed to go to the ICU on day seven because he, the small livers don't metabolize the, 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 the um, calcineurin and have one of the immunosuppressive drugs very well. And so he, he had to return to the ICU for that complication. And this just sort of demonstrates sort of what we see when we, th or clinically when we do these transplants. So in summary, I think the risk of death for left lobe transplants is about fivefold less than the right, um, this results in, in this uh, donor death per recipient life saved ratio or, or metric. Um, in terms of the risk of complications, it's probably four to 12 fold higher than the, than the <coughs> with the right lobe as versus the left. And the complications as measured, um, we have scales to measure the severity of complications are probably seem to be more severe after donation of the right lobe. <coughs> the relationship of of graph size to outcome is unclear and a graph to recipient weight ratio of greater than 0.3. And I think inflow modification may be important in improving graft outcome, but we don't quite know what we're doing here. <coughs> in, in the end, I think left lobes do shift the risk from the donor to the recipient. There's no clear increased recipient risk associated with it. And I think we should probably use the left lobes and in, in preference the right lobes when there's a graft weight to standard liver volume greater than 30 to 40 percent. I do think there is some increased uh, recipient risk if the graft is too small, um, but we I think we still need to consider doing the left lobe and, a, and a, at a graft weight to standard liver volume le of less than 30 percent. I think we have to consider using inflow modification depending on the, the degree of portal pressure. There are people that you just, you know, the say a small woman uh, wanted to donate to a large male, that their left lobe may just be too small to do that. And we don't, I think you, in, so we do do right lobes from time to time. We really try to do the left. And if we have somebody that, that we're the, where we have a larger donor, we'll go with the larger donor, hoping that we can actually do a left lobe. So I'm not, a, I'm not, ruling out doing a right lobe, but I think we need, everybody has to be understand that there's an increased recipient risk with very small graphs, <clears throat> and if there's no inclear, increased recipient risk, I think we should definitely use the left lobe graphs. And I want to thank <coughs> Will and Mark, uh, <coughs> Nancy Asher, who's my wife and boss, uh, Jean Botha, Chris Fries, <coughs> who's ran the A2L study at UCSF, and then the UCSF team. Thank you very much. As uh, other people start uh, developing their questions, John, I'll, I'll start off. Um, so, you know, when we started with uh, a, a living donor liver transplants, we kind of put a, a, a sh just a really a shot in the in the night um, regarding what we thought the mortality and morbidity would be for the left lateral segments. Um, I'm not sure how right or wrong we were with that, but. Um, so I think that the biggest question that I would have right now is, is that do we have enough in of the left lobes to really know what the, the real 
complication and, and mortality rate is going to be? Well, I think we, you know, based on the, what we know from, from around the world, we probably have, you know, there's going to be some error bar, with the, uh, the estimate as is probably with the right but I, I do think that the number of probably, you know, one-fifth the risk of the right lobe is probably a thing that most people are relatively comfortable with. Yeah, and certainly, you know, from a technical point of view, the, the left lobe uh, and the anatomy and the hilum for the left lobe is, is uh, a lot easier to deal with than the variety of issues that we have to deal with the right lobe. So it would make, from a technical surgical point of view, it would make sense that it's, it's uh, technically easier and therefore uh, less complications. In the original paper that, that Mike is referring to, um, that is a 1989 paper when only two or three of these left lateral segments had been done in the world, and we were embarking on a protocol study of 40. Um, our estimate was one in 100 to one in 200 risk of mortality for a, a left lateral. Uh, turned out in retrospect that we probably overestimated that by a factor of 12 to 15 that the, the actual risk for a left lateral is probably one in 1,500 or something like that. But, but we wanted to go high in that original paper before many of these procedures had been done. And, and just to put in context, the risk of donating a kidney is probably about one in 3,000. So, you know, the one in 1,000, one in 3,000 for kidney, one in 1,000 for a lateral segment or left low, maybe it's a little bit. Maybe it's one in 1,500, and then for a right lobe, sort of one in the two to 500 range. So that just helps you with that perspective. And as long as you bring up the kidney, you know, um, we've, also, we've, we've been doing this risk stratification in kidney transplantation forever, right? If, if two kidneys are anatomically the same, but there's one that has a differential function, for the donation, we take the one who has the less function. And, and, and give that to the recipient. Yeah, and give that yeah. to the recipient, yeah. Thanks. I uh, appreciated your, uh, first of all, the efforts to try to decrease the risk to the, uh, to the donor, which I think are, are really critical in this. And I also was um, in, um, probably not as surprised maybe as you were about the, uh, the question you asked of your audience in terms of their willingness to donate and the risk they were willing to take. Um, but I wonder if that's the right paradigm through which we ought to ask the question, um, and I wonder if it isn't um, useful to ask, and wonder if anybody ever has, to ask potential recipients what risk to the donor they would find acceptable. No, no, I think he said what, I, I what, what decrease, what decrease 